Take six. Hello, thanks for joining me for another episode of Life and Surround. This is a video I've been meaning to do for a long, long time, but I needed the opportunity to try to absorb everything that's going on here. Layla and Other Assorted Love Songs by Derek and the Dominoes. <laughs> Okay, not only is this a legendary double album from a blues rock giant, Eric Clapton, and the band that formed around him at the time, Derek and the Dominoes, but this album has also received two unique 5.1 mixes, which puts it solidly on my radar. It has a standalone SACD release and a later deluxe set release with a DVD. So let's uh, look at the SACD because there's not a lot to show, not a lot to go over, and then we'll move on to the deluxe set. SACD comes in a standard CD jewel case, front and back artwork seek to mimic the original LP sleeve. Opening it up, we have this Playzone SACD and CD player sticker for the uninitiated so they wouldn't be too confused. And then we have the SACD. Shiny gold disc. Not sure that matters for Sonics at all. But it kind of goes with the artwork. Uh, CD stereo, SACD stereo, and SACD 5.1 on this hybrid disc. Okay. And I forgot to do some market research to see how affordable that is, but it could be a factor in whether you ever pick it up. Because the deluxe set is pretty pricey. But let's let's look at the deluxe box now. Because there is a lot of value here, uh, even if it is expensive at this time. For one thing, popping open the magnetic front, lifting up the cover, reveals this pop-up art, and in my opinion, if you're going to do a deluxe box, <laughs> pop-up art is a pretty nifty attribute. I just cut this dowel this morning for this video so that we can leave the pop-up art on display. <laughs> That's production value for you, all right? So moving on, we uh, get the DVD video that houses an Elliott Shiner 5.1 mix. Points off for using 90s technology, but added points for hiring Elliott Shiner, the godfather of surround. Has he done it once again with this mix, or will the SACD win? You gotta watch to find out. It's moving on with the deluxe set features. You get this uh, replica of a double gatefold album and I guess the value here would be just the large print format of the album art front and back. And then opening it up, you get kind of some clumsy housing of the optical discs, which go over here. Why is there only one here? Because the album and the concert are out in my car. The remaining disc here is a collection of associated tracks, like singles produced by Phil Spector, alternate takes, songs that didn't make this album, songs that were slated for Derek and the Domino's second album. How exciting would that have been to come out? And then uh, the DVD is over there in the bottom of the, of the box right now. Now, these two sides house double vinyl which I honestly will probably never play. So if anyone wants to make an offer on the double vinyl, I'll send it to you in this double gatefold. How about that? And I'll figure out something to do with the optical discs. I would highly prefer if at least the DVD had its own cardboard sleeve. All right, moving along, deluxe set. You get three faux Concert tickets. 
yeah, on basically construction paper. So 1970. I suppose if you examine these closely, they have a story to tell. But they're all from the same evening, I think. And they're just like different sections. Derek and the Dominoes, Eric Clapton, Bobby Whitlock, Carl Radel, and Jim Gordon. Alright, you get this Discs Made in Germany sticker. So this is as close as I have to a hype sticker for this one. So I'll cherish that always. You get this Derek is Eric lapel pin, which in my case, and in the case of many others, poked holes in like almost everything else in the set. Like my book is shredded, those ticket stubs have divots. Um, this little grommet doesn't really protect against that pin as well as it should have. So rattling around in shipping, yeah, it did some damage. But anyway, Derek is Eric. Maybe these were made as pins at the time. You could put it on your jacket or your lapel or your, your backpack or what have you. You get this Layla cover art guitar pick cover decal, which I uh, imagine nobody will ever unpeel and stick on an actual guitar pick cover, but it is kind of cool because it just demonstrates how important the Stratocaster was to Clapton and his sound and his mojo. And then you get a big print of the cover art. In case you end up selling the gatefold, you still have large format for the cover art. And then I already mentioned the book, which is a little bit shredded up. I actually took the time to read the essay here. And you also get two sections on both major studios that were used. You get master tape pictures. And um, you learn some interesting tidbits. At least for me, I was not around for the release of this album. I wasn't even born yet. So I had a lot of confusion over this album. I thought that this was a major collaboration between Eric Clapton and Dwayne Allman, first and foremost, and that's not true. This was uh, Clapton's first attempt to really be more or less anonymous within a band and not have the band be about him but just a group of musicians that he resonated with and could jam with and write songs with and just be a part of a band trying to be very equal with showcasing instrumental prowess and the like. Dwayne Allman happened to come into the recording process pretty late and though Clapton ended up trying to steal him to be a fifth member of Derek and the Dominoes, especially on tour. Dwayne turned him down because the Allman Brothers were catching fire, and thankfully, even in Surround, we have Idle Wild South, Live at the Fillmore East, Eat a Peach, and it would be well worth doing some Allman Brothers in Surround for you sometime. But anyway, that error in uh, my mythology was corrected, and I also delved deeper into the artistic meaning of Layla, Clapton was reading a poem, if I remember correctly, and Layla is a love story. And since he was battling, struggling to make sense of, come to terms with his unrequited love affair with George Harrison's wife, Patty Boyd, the composition really spoke to him. Layla, being Persian for dark beauty, became his ultimate centerpiece symbol for what this album means. This album is an examination of love across most tracks. You get the blatant examination of being in love with someone who's already taken, and not only taken, but attached to your best friend. So you can have a sense of guilt and betrayal. You get unrequited love. You get the longing of love, the determination of love, the frustration of love exasperation, judgment, anger, rejection. There are just some amazing songs on this album. I feel that a few of them could benefit from being edited down 
like instead of six or seven minutes, maybe a four minute song. This album is densely, densely layered and sometimes that works really well and sometimes it really is a bit overpowering for me, especially on the tracks where you not only have many layered guitars, but you have many layered, densely distorted guitars. It's sort of this brittle buzzsaw distortion, like a vintage single coil strat run through a fuzz face, perhaps. That can work, and I appreciate that Clapton was influenced by Jimi Hendrix on this recording, and there's even a Jimi Hendrix composition, The Mighty Little Wing but maybe the layers just got to be a bit too much. Like I said, at least on some tracks, like Why Is Love Gotta Be So Sad, not only is it like dense and just really in your face, but the playing is what I would call frenetic. Like you can definitely hear the cocaine coming off this record. Now that leads me to a point. This album is extremely dense, and like I said, that doesn't work perfectly well for me uh, across every track. There are some super pleasant tracks on this, like I Am Yours, and some songs even with the uh, distorted guitars work super well, like the title track, Layla. But uh, one huge benefit of this deluxe set, and it may be available elsewhere, I'm not sure, such as Tidal or some streaming service, or it may have received a standalone release. But the concert that comes in this deluxe set not only is just amazingly performed, it sounds awesome, especially for a 1970 concert. Clapton shreds just incredibly, and you get great performances, solo performances on drums and standout moments with the other players as well. But the big, huge benefit for me is they're playing as a four-piece. And you don't get overdubs, you don't get this just wall of sound in your face, just brutal, saturated presentation. You get a much more stripped-down approach to every track, and also Clapton's chosen tones tend to be more what I'm familiar with, that clear and well-defined single coil sound, and even some wah-wah, sounds that I associate with Cream and Blind Faith, and some of Clapton's solo works that I'm aware of. So I find myself preferring the sound of the show to that of much of the album. So it's a huge benefit to me to have the show included in the deluxe set. The disc of associated tracks hasn't really captured my interest quite yet. I will probably uh, give it more listens in years to come. It was nice to run through it, and especially uh, those tracks that were slated for a second album. It has you wondering, like, what if they had stuck together and pushed through and made that record? How great would it have been? All right, so all that said, let's look at these 5.1 mixes. First and foremost, they are different mixes. Let's take a look at Guzowski's SACD 5.1 mix here. You can see that each channel is fairly low in amplitude. And then let's transition over to Shiner's DVD video 5.1 mix. Now interestingly for me, if you look over on Quadraphonic Quad, you see a general distaste for the SACD and you see a general favorable response to the DVD. Now that could be because Guzowski is relatively unknown in the surround world as far as I'm aware so far, and Shiner is extremely well known and has a solid reputation. In putting them on myself and doing my best to volume match because the SACD just simply has lower amplitude, for me that meant raising up the SACD around 5 or 6 dB, and I did it unscientifically, I didn't use a sound pressure meter, I used my ears, but I did my best to volume match because that is important, because the human brain will tend to hear louder as better. So volume matching, putting on both albums, and then also zeroing in on favorite songs like Bell Bottom Blues, Nobody Knows You When You're Down and Out, Little Wing, Title Track, I can tell you that to my ears, the DVD sounds much more pleasant. So sonically, I'm going to give it to the DVD, 
even though I tend to prefer really gentle mastering, the SACD isn't necessarily more dynamic. If you raise it up to around the same volume as the DVD, like you can see that its peaks are fairly limited. It's like somebody just forgot to raise the amplitude at the end of like a mastering or limiting process. The SACD has kind of a, I don't know, a murky, muddled, dingy sound to me. It also has some other issues. I'm not convinced that the SACD and the DVD use the same tracks, and at times I feel like inferior takes might have been used for the SACD, particularly during this video's surround standout moment. The surround standout moment, the thing that uh, just has been buzzing through my mind for the last few days since I first really, really noticed it, was the main riff for Layla. As Elliot Shiner approaches it, has this like triangular formation to it. You have uh, the main rhythm guitar spread across the front channels, more or less. And you have the main lick, that seven tone lick, that ain't no sunshine when she's gone on steroids. Ain't no sunshine when she's gone. Do 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 do. Up front, front and center, and then you have harmonious accompaniment to your left and your right. And it's just awesome. So let's go ahead and take a listen to that. We're going to hear the front channels of Shiner's mix and then the rears. And just realize that you're getting like that main lead voice in the front phantom center. And then two harmonies to your left and your right all around you. Here we go. Let's go listen to that same passage from the SACD, and I'm going to do my best to volume match for you so that that won't be too much of a bias. All right, now to my ears. Not only is the sound less clear and pleasant with that example, but there's also something like wrong with at least one of those tracks. Like I think it might have been an early unused take. It sounds frankly a little bit out of tune and maybe like the idea of the harmony hadn't quite solidified for Clapton uh, because what I'm hearing in the Shiner version like totally works and it's locked in and it's amazing, and there's just something off about the Guzowski version. Alright, so having listened through to both the SACD and the 5.1 DVD, I have to give the nod to the DVD. Even if it's more expensive to track down than the SACD. And I apologize that I completely forgot to go do some market research on that. But uh, what I'll do is I'll go at least look on Discogs or eBay or something, and I'll, I'll put some links below. I'm guessing that you'll be able to get the SACD far cheaper. But is it a satisfying 5.1 listen? I will say that it is for some tracks more than others. So if it really truly is your only option, or you see like a deal that you can't bypass, go ahead and grab it. Some tracks work pretty well. Uh, the DVD is more consistent, it's more discreet, it sounds more pleasant. There is one possible issue that I need to bring up for you, because my very, very, very beloved associate, Elad, aka Dale, put a lot of time into helping me examine this mix, and though I like the Shiner mix for the title track Layla better than he does, uh, one contention is that Shiner mixed the lead vocal lower in comparison to the band than you would be used to hearing on LP, CD, or radio over the years. Now, in an interview 
of Elliot Shiner up on immersiveaudioalbum.com, he states that he's aware that he made some different mixing decisions from the original engineers, and he's proud of what he did. Now, also from the essay contained in the Deluxe Box book, we find that Clapton was never really happy with how much his lead vocal sat above the band for this recording. That decision was made in an effort to give him some pop star potential alongside hit makers like Mick Jagger at the time. But Clapton preferred if his vocal sat down more as just one of the jam instruments. So it's possible that Shiner either was guided by Clapton personally or was aware of Clapton's preference over the years and made a decision to tuck that vocal down a little bit. Now even on the original release of Layla, the title track, the vocal isn't all that out front and it actually gets a little bit washed out to my hearing on a line or two every now and then. So Shiner hasn't mixed it all that drastically differently and also he did us a favor by leaving some dry vocal pretty well isolated in the center channel. So you can always bump up your center channel to taste. What do you do when you get lonely? And nobody's waiting by your side. You've been running and much too long. In my case, I can do that easily on my Emotiva UMC 200 with the push of a button. And I found that a little bit of a, like a 2 dB boost made his voice sound pretty much as I remember and then a 5 dB boost positively sends the vocal like up above the band. So anyway, I wanted to point that out just in case you get the DVD, put it on, and you like almost everything about it, and then you're wondering about the vocal amplitude on the title track and maybe another track here or there. Uh, Shiner did us a solid on this one by putting some vocal in the center channel so you have something to play with. All right. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this review. Don't forget to thumbs up, subscribe, ring the notification bell, leave your comments below. What do you think about these two mixes? The deluxe set, Eric Clapton, Derek and the Dominoes in general, his love story with Patty Boyd. And you know, she was not impressed by this album, but they did end up together about a year later. So, you know, maybe love conquers all. I don't know. It's a fascinating part of the mythology of this album, though. I understand why it is legendary. I'm glad that, based on the 5.1 mixes, I was given the impetus to really dive in and check it out. I don't love everything about the album, some song lengths, some of the production decisions, but I love plenty of it, and especially the concert that comes with the deluxe set. So. I hate to say it, but even if it is expensive right now, I recommend going and tracking it down. So I hope you all are doing well. I'm headed off on a two week military assignment, so I'll try to produce some content, but no promises. And worst case scenario, I'll see you all in a few weeks with something hopefully fun and enjoyable and educational. Until next time, live life in surround.